ये मानचेस्टर का एक शादी हॉल है जहाँ पर लोग आके अपनी खुशियाँ मनाते हैं और आल रसूल के मानने वाले यहाँ पे आकर आल रसूल का गम मना रहे हैं दस दिन के लिए इन्होंने बुक किया है और आपको भी दिखाते हैं कि क्या हो रहा है आज का जो प्रोग्राम है इसमें अप्रॉक्सीमेटली सेवेंटी से एटी परसेंट जो है ना वो पाकिस्तानी है और इसके अलावा बाकी अरबिक और और काफ़ी लोगों से के लोग आते हैं यहाँ पर और जो बता रहे हैं यहाँ के फैक्ट एंड फिगर वो अप्रॉक्सीमेटली पंद्रह सौ से सोलह सौ बंदा एक दिन में यहाँ पे आता है तो इनका इंतज़ाम करना ये बहुत बड़ी बात है तो आप पूरी वीडियो जब देखोगे तो इन आपको भी अच्छा लगेगा मज़ा आएगा और हमारे लिए
the Imam says that we should have a notebook, perhaps, not the words of the Imam, but this is what he's suggesting. Have something in which you write the things that you learn, whether it's from a scholar, qualified speaker, your parents, a good book that you happen to be reading, a word of wisdom that you hear from someone. The Imam says, write it down. Keep that in your home. Keep it close to you. In other words, the youth of our community, community, the children in our families, they should strive to keep a notebook in order to preserve what they learn. There's a lot of emphasis placed on writing, by the way, on, on traditions. Because, and it's interesting, psychologists actually say that the reason writing is such a good tool to memorizing and to instilling the knowledge that you gain is because you can't think about something else while writing. In other words, you could be distracted by the world around you while listening, but when it comes to writing, you have to be focused. And that's why it's important to keep a note of the things that truly matter. Kids in school know this already, but when it comes to religion, unfortunately this is not common practice. I can see some youth, may Allah bless them, with a pen and paper, writing down what is being taught to them. Now, in another hadith, our sixth Imam, As-Sadiq alayhi salatu was He emphasizes not so much the role of the youth and the children, but the role of their parents. The Imam says, what is the best thing that you can leave your children with when you depart from this world? Most parents, they feel that the best thing they can leave their children with is wealth, a sizable estate, a house where they can live in, especially if the parents themselves came from a background of poverty, financial distress and struggle. And so there's this nagging fear in the back of their minds that I don't want to leave my children with nothing so that they might end up suffering the way I did. And that's a reasonable thing to strive towards. However, the Imam says, the best thing a parent can leave their children after they depart this world with is Al-Adab. Adab is a broad term. In its linguistic sense, it means discipline. And surely this is something that is encompassed in the word Adab. Imagine someone leaves this world, dies, and their children lack basic discipline, basic manners. They project this personality that is devoid of akhlaq, devoid of honesty, integrity, trustworthiness, bravery, generosity, all these things. What do people say about the father? You'll often hear people saying, the father was a good man, their mother was a good woman, she would attend the majal, she would go to Ziyara, she would cook for Imam al Hussein's gatherings and all that. But look at how the kids turned out. Even when adding this caveat about the parents being good people, you can't help but feel that there was a blemish, there was a flaw in the way they raised their children. And so the Imam says that the best thing you can leave your children with is akhlaq and adab. Teach them this. As I said last night, have a clear plan for your parenting. Ensure that you are deliberate, that it's not haphazard. It's not, yeah, we became parents and we kind of did the best we could. No, the best we could is not enough. You have to have a clear parenting philosophy that when it comes to my child's generosity, how do I instill this value in them? When it comes to their 
perhaps integrity and trustworthiness and reliability, and for them to uphold their responsibilities towards other people when they make a promise, their honesty. What did you do in order to make your child an honest person? What did you do to have a child who is brave, a child who's not scared, a child who's not intimidated by other people criticizing them for their religiosity, for their hijab, for the way they dress, for the fact that they mourn Imam Hussein. What did you do in that way? Oh, I took them to the majalis and I was hoping that the speakers would do their job and discipline my children. That's not good enough. The speakers have a very limited time. Even the speakers who actually teach us the instructions of the Ahlul Bayt are not many. There's not many of them out there, unfortunately. There are some incredible speakers out there, but that's not the norm. Oftentimes, subjects are discussed from the Mimbah that are completely irrelevant. They are what YouTubers call clickbait. They're designed to attract attention or somehow benefit one person or another. That is a sad reality that we face. But even those speakers who are intent on teaching their audience the instructions of the Ahlul the Prophet, and the Imams, السلام, even they have a very, very condensed amount of time at their disposal. What's an hour over a 10-day period in an entire year? Nothing. Our religion is a robust and complex set of instructions and morals and teachings. Bi'aw al-anwar, the magnum opus of Al-Allama Muhammad Baqir al-Majlisi, may Allah bless his soul and raise him until he is raised with the Ahlul Bayt themselves, has a book that spans 110 volumes. How much of that is a speaker able to impart on the audience? There has to be a plan where the parents take responsibility. Hold the reins. Hold the bull by the horns as they say. And as I mentioned last night, the last thing you want to do is delegate your parenting to society, to the school, to the mosque, or even to the local alim. You don't want to do that. Delegating your tasks and your responsibilities as a parent to society is like trusting a drug addict with your wallet. Who does that? There are too many wolves in sheep skin, and they have begun to bear their sharp fangs. Before it was a little more subtle, a little more discreet. Now they're openly doing it. And so do you trust the system? with your children's upbringing and child rearing? That is the worst form of the dereliction of your duties as a parent. So, the Imam says that you need to discipline them, teach them, and that is the best thing you can leave them when you leave this world. They will be a source of honor, they will project the goodness within you after you've departed from this world. And the hadith says that when a person dies, they will be severed from this world, meaning that they will have no access to doing good deeds so as to cleanse their sins or elevate their status in the afterlife, except through a very small, limited number of things, one of which is walad and salih or yad'ubna. A good son or daughter will praise for their parents. Praise for them. And is a reflection of the moral compass that they provided their children with after they departed. In other words, this is your biggest investment. It's not buying a house. It's not giving them a good secular education so that they could earn a stable position or good job or have a career. All those things are secondary and tertiary. Your biggest investment in life when deciding how much of your time and energy and your wealth you wish to allocate to your child's discipline and upbringing, this is your biggest investment, your number one priority. SubhanAllah, when you look at our scholars, 
people often imagine that these scholars are geniuses, but that's not the case. We had scholars who are geniuses, but even a genius has to exert maximum effort to achieve their potential. Someone who's so smart that they could memorize a passage or a mathematical formula by examining it just one time. Even they have to work hard. They have to study, they have to learn, they have to spend many sleepless nights before they're able to invent something, before they're able to contribute to society, for example. Even the likes of Ash-Shaykh al-Bahai, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi, this great scholar, lived over 400 years ago. And when you look at his accolades, it's bobsmacking, it's absolutely mesmerizing to see what he was able to achieve. He was what we now call a polymath, meaning he was an expert in more than one discipline. It takes a lifetime to become an expert in any one given discipline. And yet, scholars have stated that he has proved his expertise in at least 25 different disciplines. 25 fields of science. From jurisprudence, to linguistics, to mathematics, to physics, to architecture, to geometry. And I'm not just saying this, you could go to the city of Asfahan and you will see his artistry and his mastery of those disciplines on display. The biggest and most ornate and most beautiful mosque in Asfahan was designed and built by Sheikh al who was an architect of the highest caliber. His knowledge and expertise in physics and chemistry was absolutely incredible. I'll give you one example, you might have heard this. There's a bathhouse named after Sheikh al-Bahai in Isfahan. It was opened up, up until about 20 or 30 years ago. Now it's a heritage listed uh, site, and it's close to the public. However, it was open where people could actually go and take a bath there, only a few decades ago. The entire bath was designed by Sheikh al-Bahai, and it was run meaning the water was boiled using just one candle. One candle. In other words, it had no external energy source except a candle. And this mesmerized and baffled people for the last four centuries. How is the water in this bathhouse always hot when the only energy source is a candle? Recently, Someone conducted research and looked into it. Someone who's in charge of the Department of Innovation or something along those lines. And what they uh, found was that Sheikh al-Bahai did at least two things. Number one, the boiler in the house, in the bathhouse, was made of gold, which is uh, one of the most, uh, one of the best metals to use as it conducts heat and electricity better than any other metal. And that's part of the reason why they closed down the bathhouse. And this wasn't popular, you know, it wasn't spoken about in the media too much because they were afraid that thieves would come and steal the boiler. The other thing he did, which is again, absolutely incredible, 400 years ago, we're talking about a scholar, not an imam. What he had done was that he had designed the old city of Isfahan, again he was, the city planner and the architect for the entire city. Despite being a jurist and despite being a linguist and a mathematician and an astronomer, astronomer and all that. Such that the sewage system would be connected to the bathhouse. Now imagine with all the sewage coming into the bathhouse in a very elaborate system that he had designed, the methane gas, which is a highly flammable and combustible gas, that was being generated by the city sewage was then used in order to create the boiler, to heat the water, and to provide almost an endless amount of boiling water for this bathhouse. SubhanAllah. How is it that our scholars were like this? And 
admit nowadays, you look at someone like me and you look at some other youth out there, and you're like, we've made zero progress. People often talk about how you know, Islam had a golden age, which by the way, I don't subscribe to that. The so-called golden age of Islam was not during the oppressive, tyrannical, Abbasid caliphate, because that was the age when Ahlul Bayt were being persecuted and the Shia were being killed left, right, and center. And what they mean by the golden age is that some Greek philosophy books were translated into Arabic and some inventions were made, which had nothing to do with the Abbasid caliphate. You can't credit Harun, alayhi Allah, the killer of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, for being the force behind the innovations that were made. The innovations were made partly because of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, Imam Sadiq. One of his students was Jabir ibn Hayyan, one. And he begins every chapter of his book on chemistry. Sami'tu Sayyidi wa Mawlai. Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq yaqul kada wa kada. He would quote Imam Sadiq in his books. Now, the point is that there were periods in our history where inventions were made, scholars were pioneers of not just jurisprudence and exegesis and other related disciplines and sciences that are connected to our religion, but also so called secular sciences. Is that possible for us to revive? Inshallah, we'll talk about this in a subsequent lecture. Absolutely. But my point here is that, take another example from a contemporary age. Grand Ayatollah Sheikh Waheed Khurasani, may Allah bless him and elevate his status and give him a long and healthy life of service to the Ahlul Bayt, the Dean of the Islamic Seminary in the Holy City of Qom. He's over a hundred years old now. Sheikh Ba'id Khurasani was only 19 when he began attending the highest level of classes within the Islamic seminaries known as Dars al Kharij uh, of Grand Ayatollah Mirza Mahdi Asfahani in the Holy City of Mashhad. He was only 19 years old. My own father was about 18 years old when he started attending Dars al Kharij. Other scholars and Mushtahideen and Maraja. Imagine when you start attending Dars al Kharaj, which is the most complex discussions about jurisprudence and deductive uh, jurisprudence where you extrapolate, it's the process of extrapolating religious rulings from its primary sources. So you need to be very well versed and be an expert, in fact, in the Holy Quran and its exegesis. You need to be an expert in Hadith, you need to be an expert in the, other, in the opinions of other scholars and so on for you to start attending these classes at the age of 18 means how much work had to go into your discipline and your education by that time. Shaykh Wahid says that I attended those classes when I was 19. Then I went to Najaf. At the age of 25, a 25 year old now is most likely at best a YouTuber if they're lucky. At best, they're a gamer. They spend their time playing video games. He says, at the age of 25, I was invited by the supreme Najah of the day, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Hassan al-Sfahani, to recite the Majalis and give lectures in his home, which if you take the position of Sayyid Abu Hassan al-Sfahani, it would be equivalent to that of Sayyid Sistani now, if not greater. Because he was the only manja. All the followers of the Ahlul Bayt emulated Sayyid Abu Hassan. The official majlis in the Sayyid's home was held and the speaker was this 25 year old student from Masha, Jabari Hassan. He says, I recited the lectures, I delivered the majlis, and those in attendance were the future maraja of the day. Sayyid Abu Qasim al Khor, Sayyid Shah Rudi. People of that caliber, they were the audience members. Imagine what level of knowledge you have to have to have these individuals listening to you. Whether there's any room for error. 
Sayyid al Hakim, Sayyid Muhsin al Hakim was in attendance. So he says, I delivered the majlis five nights. After every majlis, these grand scholars, Sayyid Khoi, Shah Rudi, Hakim, as well as others, would all say, Ahsan, Ahsan, may Allah, Fasakum, may Allah bless you for that beneficial lecture and that majlis and the remembrance of Imam al Hussein. Barakallahu feek. You know, words of praise and encouragement. But they wouldn't say this lightly, though. If somebody didn't do good, a good enough job, a marja, a jurist, a faqih of that caliber, wouldn't say, may Allah bless you for that lecture. He says, I did all that, and the people would encourage me, the scholars would encourage me, they would praise me, except to Abu Hassan al Saham. He never said a word. Night one, night two, night three, after five nights, I got off the minbar. Sayyid Abu Hassan called me. He said, tomorrow meet me in my hujra, meaning the dorm that's allocated to seminary students in such and such school in the holy city of Najaf. I want you to come and see me at 8 a.m. He said, absolutely, say it that way. So I went there a little earlier. I didn't want the Najaf to sit there waiting for me. So I stood outside in the courtyard. I waited for the city to arrive. He went up to his dorm, his room. We sat there. He said to me, There were really good majalis that he recited. May Allah bless you. May Allah increase your knowledge. However, next year, I'd like to invite you back. But when I do, make sure that you have improved your majalis. If you recited the same level of majalis and lectures, I will be displeased with you. I want you to prove yourself, even though they were very good. Then he said to me, the Sheikh says, he said that, he quoted a hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said, Man kasawa yawmah fahuwa maghboon. Whoever feels that yesterday and today are equal, meaning that he or she did not improve, then they're at a loss. Mahbud is someone who enters into a financial transaction and ends up losing. And the Lord he says that if today is equal, equal, not worse. If it's worse, the Imam says, This person's cursed. If I ever find myself feeling that last year in Muharram I was a better Muslim, I was more devout, I was more pious, I was more attentive to my religious obligations, and this year I feel like I've gone a few steps back, there is serious reasons for concern. So he said, the Sayyid told me, I am teaching you this now, because 40 years ago, my own teacher in this very room said the same thing to me. In other words, I am who I am now because I always strive to be better, to improve myself. If I feel like, let's say for example, my prayers now include the bare bones minimum. I perform my obligatory salawat and this is the best I can do at the moment. I have to strive that from the end of Muharram or after the, of the day of Ashura, my prayer should be improved. It should be better. My wudu has to be improved. If I don't pray recommended prayers, for, for example, whether it's Al-Ghufayla, Mutayra, Salatul Day, or any of those things, if I don't do that now, I should strive to start to do that next year. You don't have to over, overwhelm yourself. You don't have to suddenly start to become the most religious person in town. Start with small incremental steps. With Salatul Layl, do one rakah. One rakah. And then maybe in six months time, when you get used to it, you can then do another rakah. And then in five years time, you're doing Salatul Layl. And you have no issues with it whatsoever. If my hijab now is a bare bones minimum kind of hijab, I should strive to make it better. If for example, I wear makeup in public as of now, and of course, there are always justifications for that. What people might think, 
whether I'm going to find a husband or not. My family says you should do this. It's only foundation, and it doesn't actually show. Well, I mean, if it didn't show, then why am I putting it on? Surely it shows something, it reveals something. If I am suffering from this problem, then I will strive from the day of Ashura or the beginning of Muharram not to do that anymore. If it's a sin, it definitely has to be avoided. But if it's a matter of virtue, then let's try to incrementally and gradually increase the things that we do. Because before you know it, and I'm addressing the youth especially and the children, before you know it, you'll be 30 years old and 40 years old and 50 years old. And at that point in your life, your personality has been molded and it's fixed. You won't be able to do much after that. You'll be too busy and too distracted. You'll be overwhelmed with your personal lives and your responsibilities and your issues and your diseases and sicknesses and pains and aches and so on and so forth. Start now so that by that time, you'll be in a very good position. This is how our scholars were and this is how they are. They strive hard, they work hard. Remember the hadith, I'm sure you've heard this hadith many times before, where the Holy Prophet, as well as subsequent Imams, they divide the life of a child into three phases, seven years each, right? You've heard the hadith, I don't want to get into it too much. You've got the first seven years where the Imams tell us, let him play. Don't try to overburden him or her. Don't put too much pressure on them where they have to learn things and they have to memorize things and they have to read all of these books. Don't do that. Give them space to play, to express themselves as children, their inner as well as outer child to manifest itself. Let them let off some steam. That's the point. Seven years of giving them a free time and space. By the way, there's another hadith which I've talked about in previous lectures, in previous years. Then listen to this, it's absolutely mesmerizing. 
The Imam says that at the age of three years, seven months, and 20 days, these are not arbitrary numbers. There's a reason behind this. What it is, I have no clue. But the same Imam that teaches me about heaven and hell and the afterlife and what happens is the one who's teaching me this. At the age of three, seven months and 20 days, teach them to say, Muhammadun Rasulullah. I think the Holy Prophet and the Imam of the time, who's the host of these majalis, deserves a lot of salawat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The third one for the hastening of the reappearance of the master of the time, Al Hujjat ibn al Hassan.
So then the Prophet makes a declaration. It's a siren of warning to all of us. He says, these parents, I disassociate from these parents to highlight the severity of this negligent type of parenting. Teach them what they need. Anyway, the greatest parents were the Ahlul Bayt. And they raised children who were like no other. Even those who were not infallible. They were normal children, but who had the privilege of being raised in a family with a father like Imam Hussein, a father like Imam Hassan, a father like Amir al-Mu'mineen. Obviously, every once in a while, there's an anomaly. There's a child who is insubordinate, a child who veers off from the path of the Ahlul Bayt. This is true also of the families of the prophets. It happens. The parents could exert every effort, but then society is a dangerous place. And so these children grew up in the most splendid manner. When Imam Hassan was about to depart this world, he left instructions, his last will and testament, with his beloved brother, Abu Abdullah Hussein. One of which was this. He says, Kun li awladi aban wa'a'iya, ya Abu Abdullah. I wish for you to look after my children. I'm leaving this world and they're going to be orphaned. <laughs> Al Qasim ibn al Hassan grew up in the lap of his uncle Aba Abdullah since he was three years old. Not only was Al Qasim an orphan, which meant that Imam al Hussein dedicated everything to his well being and his protection. And so that he doesn't feel like an orphan. He doesn't remember that he doesn't have a father. Not only did he do that because Qasim was an orphan. Imam al Hussein himself in the ziyara we say, Imam al Hussein was the most merciful person. He is like a father to all of us. Let alone when it comes to his brother's son, about whom Imam al Hassan left specific instructions. Look after my children. Allahu Akbar. Who? Imam al Hassan. Imam al Hussein would never utter a word in the presence of his brother, Imam al Hassan. As great and lofty as Imam Hussein was, he would call his brother Sayyidi Mawla. He was the Imam of Imam Hussein. This kind of father, this kind of uncle, and this kind of child, you can only imagine the sort of relationship that Imam Hussein had with his nephew Al Qasim. I can't open up this tragedy too much. But I will say a few things. Number one, Imam al Hussein never fainted on the plains of Karbala. Not when his son Ali al Akbar fell to the ground. And Imam al Hussein rushed to him saying, Waladi Ali ala dunya ba'dak al Imam al Hussein did not 